Hey everybody, this is Kim from Read It Again Bookstore and today I am talking to Lauren Willig. Lauren wrote, okay, she's written a lot. How many books have you written? Well, Band of Sisters is my 21st book. So I like to say it's my book that's old enough to drink. Drink, awesome, oh my goodness. Cause okay, you've got your standalones and then you have your Pink Carnation series, which is how I knew you originally. Right, that's how I got started. Cause my Pink Carnation series, they were the books that were never supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Because, um, so I, always desperately want to write historical fiction, but I thought I was going to write, well, stuff more like Band of Sisters. Mm -hmm. Big, you know, very um, minutely researched doorstop historical fiction. And mm -hmm. I wanted to get a PhD in history. So I'd have the material to write my absolutely accurate historical fiction. Yeah. I thought you could do absolute accuracy. But anyway, so, but while I was trying to avoid working on my dissertation, I needed something to keep me sane. So I wrote a Regency romp, you know, a spoof of the Scarlet Pimpernel with <laughs> girl named spies and lots of sheep jokes. It was like a Julia Quinn novel collided with Blackadder, collided mm -hmm. with Scarlet Pimpernel, collided with Bridget Jones's diary. And it was sort of, you know, it was a, a one big private in joke with a lot of, you know, spies swinging with on ropes in black masks through windows and thwarting Napoleon. And a friend gave it to an agent who decided it was just what he needed right now. And that, that book that was never supposed to be written, that was written purely for my own mental health and amusement mm -hmm. and the amusement of a few select friends it was passed around to, um, became a 12 book series. So that was the Pink Carnation series. Mm -hmm. And then while I was sort of eight books into Pink, I decided, okay, as much as I adored the Pink book and Swashbuckling Spies, I really needed to try my hand at something else and see if I could write other types of historical fiction before I turned into the pink lady forever. Mm -hmm. And I started writing some standalones too while juggling them with the series. And now these days I'm writing, um, all, well, mostly standalone novels and also co-writing with two good friends, which has been mm -hmm. its own wonderful adventure. Yeah, and Karen White's actually, she's local. She lives right around the corner from us. That's wonderful. Now Karen is one of my favorite people in the world as well as um, my co-writer. Yeah. Um, okay. So you talked a little about yourself already because I normally say, well, can you introduce yourself? So we know you have a PhD in history. Or actually I'm ABD. I never finished the PhD okay. because you know, life takes, life works in strange ways. Mm -hmm. I had decided, you know, I realized I did not actually want to be an academic that as much as I adore history and immersing myself in the archives, I'm kind of a historical dilettante. And while I loved my dissertation research, that was taking seven years to write about three years of the English Civil War. What I really like, I wanted to explore other things too. And also I really did not like grading undergrad papers. Mm -hmm. So I decided I would throw it up to fate and mm -hmm. I would lob an application to Harvard Law. And if I got in, I would finish my PhD while also doing my JD and be a lawyer. If I didn't get in, I would you know, knuckle down and try to make the academia thing work. Because I had no idea at that time I was gonna get published. Pink had been written, but I hadn't gotten that call from the agent yet. And then my first week at Harvard Law, when I was, you know, duly enrolled in the PhD program and the JD program, mm -hmm. I got that call from the agent. And next thing I knew, my first month at Harvard Law, I had a two book contract. So I wound up writing three pink books while I was in law school instead of finishing my dissertation. I kept thinking I would go back, you know, one of these days there would be time and I would go back, I would finish my dissertation. Mm -hmm. But then I was practicing as a litigator and writing pink books. And then, and right around the time when I left to write full time, I saw an article, I used, I was still got the Journal of British Studies and an article, a book review that was about a book that was basically my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's it. Someone else has written my dissertation, probably done it a lot better than I could do it at this point. I think the, the PhD is now over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm still ABD, I still have like a half written dissertation there. Um. So how did, okay, tell us about Band of Sisters. By the way, anybody watching, um, I know we're only like three months into the year, but I honestly think that Band of Sisters will be one of my favorite books of the year. Like it was so good. Oh my gosh, I've been talking about it obsessively. And so my daughter, she's like, well, who are you about to get on, on talk to? Um, I have my copy. Yay. Who, who are you about to talk to? And I'm like, well, I'm about to sit down with the author Band of Sisters. And she's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're getting a big hug for me. And that is so lovely of you. Thank you. Uh, Band of Sisters. So this is another one of these books that happened by accident, which is the way the best things always happen to me. I was 
researching a book that I was co-writing with Karen White and Beatrice Williams. We were writing a book set in three quiet and uneventful time periods in French history, World War I, World War II, and the 1960s. And for the World War I portion, we needed to know what would Christmas have been like during the German occupation in World War I? Would they still have been able to celebrate? How would they have celebrated? You know, what Pickard Christmas customs survived? Because this is the sort of minutiae that, you know, authors go hunting for that drives us nuts. And I was desperately hunting for Christmas pick, Pickard Christmas customs, World War I. And up popped this memoir by a Smith alumna talking about throwing Christmas parties for French villagers right behind the front lines in 1917. Mm. A, this was not what I was looking for at all. But I was also like, wait, what? What are they doing there? This is, <laughs> no, this does not make sense. I assumed I had stumbled on someone's novel, that this had to be fiction, that there could not be a group of Smithies right behind the trenches. So of course I dropped everything. I read the memoir and then I went poking around to see what else I could find. And it turned out, in fact, this story was true. There were a bunch of Smith College grads who went off to rebuild home the homes and lives of French villagers right behind the front lines in 1917. Wow. And I found a video. Uh, well, first, let me, here's a link um, in the comments to your website, which has a bunch of stuff in it for people to like dive in and research more. And then I found a video on YouTube, kind of you talking about this. I'll put that in there too. There we go. So, um, where do we start? Like, oh I have so many questions. Yeah, like, okay, at the end of the book, you did that little like summary of what, what happened and how you found it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that I like the chicken. I thought that was fake. Okay, so I mean, the basic background, so the background story of the Smith College Relief Unit mm -hmm. um, is that what happened was, so, you know, most people know, we all know about occupied France and World War II and, you know, everyone singing, you know, the Marseillaise and all that. Yeah. But um, what most people don't know is that the Germans also occupied a chunk of France during World War One. It was like their proto-occupation. Because yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, my, they my great grandfather died there in, oh, in France in World War One. And he was a he wasn't even a, um, a naturalized US citizen. Like so he immigrated from Ireland to America and then immediately signed up to work uh, to fight for the Americans and died in France. So That's he's buried over there. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, and Band of Sisters actually picks up right when, Amer pretty much right when America entered the war. Um, but because we didn't enter the war until three years in. Mm -hmm. um, but what had happened was, so in the spring of 1917, the Germans got pushed back a little. And before they went, though, they decided to destroy as much as they could on the way out. And so these villages, they had been occupying not very gently. What they did was, well, first of all, they rounded up all the teenage girls who are the last able-bodied people and they shipped them off to work camps in Germany, which is just really heartbreaking. Um, but they also, they took the remaining villagers and they put them in one village while they went back to all the other villages and they destroyed all the houses, they poisoned all the wells, they broke all the plows, mm -hmm. you know, anything that could provide shelter or sustenance, they systematically destroyed. And then they said to the villagers, you can go home now, enjoy, thinking that they would starve and die and be a burden on the French war effort. And this is right before the Americans come in. So the French and the Brits are struggling on on their own. Um, anyway, but what they had not reckoned with was this one Smith alumna, Harriet Boyd Hawes, who heard about this and decided that what was need to, needed to deal with the crisis was clearly American college women. Mm -hmm. and he went back home and gave a rousing call to arms in a speech at the Smith Club in Boston in April of 1917. Um, and people rushed to join up. And so by late July of 1917, there was a group of women ready to set sail for France. They had three trucks in boxes in the hold of the ship. They had all sorts of supplies. They fundraised all this money from alumni and they were ready to go over to rebuild these people's lives from scratch. That was their mission. They were gonna go rebuild houses, buy, like you mentioned, cows and chickens mm -hmm. to rebuild the agricultural base of the region. They were gonna you know, start schools going again. These are kids who had had no school for three years. Um, and also do basic medical and social service work because a lot of these women had social service backgrounds working in urban slums. That was something upper middle class women did at the time. Mm -hmm. And there were also two doctors in the unit who um, were there to provide medical care to people who had not had medical care for a very long time. And so they all went over, but of course, stuff immediately began to go wrong as it does. They had an agriculturalist who was supposed to be the one in charge of things like buying chickens and cows mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But she worked, these are all Smith grads. 
she worked at the Department of Agriculture in DC and they could not spare her right away. So she was delayed. The rest of the group gets to Paris in mid-August. And when, by the way, when they get on the ship, this is the first moment where I think it becomes really clear to a lot of them that they've really gotten themselves into something. Because one of the mm -hmm. first things that happens is they're given um, metal tags with their names on them so they can be identified if the ship is torpedoed by the Germans and they drown. So, I mean, that was sort of a sobering wake up call for many of them. Um, and then they get to France and they've never seen anything like it. All the women are in mourning. Any men they see are missing limbs. One writes home like she's, she feels guilty to have all her arms and legs. Like the war, the realities of the war, no matter what you read in the papers, they were not very present here in America in our island fortress. But mm -hmm. they got over there and many of them had been to Paris before and they get there and Paris is not at all what they expected or what they remembered. It's mm -hmm. really grim. Um, and they have to suddenly, you know, they have to buy chickens and their agriculturalist isn't there and they accidentally buy 72 roosters and then can't figure out why none of these are laying eggs. But there's other stuff that happens too. Like, you know, they, they, they have three trucks and they desperately need these trucks first to get out to their headquarters mm -hmm. on the front. And then once they're there to be able to drive from village to village to deliver social service work and basic supplies and medical care. I mean, transportation is crucial to their plans. Mm -hmm. And the trucks are somewhere on the docks. They're not even sure where people keep promising their trucks will be delivered. Their trucks aren't delivered. And meanwhile, they're being farmed out to other social service organizations, doing canteen work with the Salvation Army for American and French soldiers. Um, doing um, building medical devices like splints for wounded men. And fortunately, their their founder is like, you know what, if our trucks are not going to come to us, we'll go to our trucks. And they find them broken up in boxes in the dock and they have to put their trucks together. And these are women who sort of know how to drive, but they're not mechanics, but their founder, her, her, her feeling was very firmly, you have a good education, you can do anything. So mm -hmm. here's the wedge, figure out how to put the trucks together. And they do, and they make it to their headquarters. But it's like you were saying about the chickens. Yeah. They, they're learning all of these things on the fly and whatever skills they have or they thought they had turn out often not to be applicable to the things they actually need to do, like mm -hmm. putting together trucks. So, and you talk about in the end, how you found, you stumbled across letters. Well, yes. Yeah. So what yeah. I did was I read that first memoir and there were some things that, that really piqued my curiosity. Like I got the feeling that it was not the full story I was reading there. The woman had a line at the beginning about, you know, the only limitations to this high endeavor were the limitations of fellowship and our own personnel, of limitations of fellowship set by our own personality. Mm -hmm. and I went to an all girls school for 13 years. Yeah. I was like, something happened. There, there, were <laughs> there was infighting, there's drama. Something yeah. went wrong. And so I went hunting and I found in 1917 and 1918, the Smith Alumni Quarterly had published excerpts of the women's letters home basically in real time. So I had these tantalizing excerpts of letters, but they were clearly heavily edited. It was like the good parts version. And there was also a pamphlet that had been put together in the 60s um, also but that told the story of the Smith unit through excerpts from their letters. And there were more letters than there were in the quarterly, but this was also clearly highly edited. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I have got to see where, you know, where can I find the real letters? Because there, there's so much stuff that's going on that I don't have answers to. And among other things, like their director leaves two weeks after they get to their headquarters. And this, the unit is her baby. I mean, she had real babies. And actually that makes it more poignant because mm -hmm. she, she left her children at home in America to go and do the unit. Because as she says in this really heartbreaking letter, you know, my children are well, and there are other children with whom all is not well, and mm -hmm. their lives too are precious in the eyes of God. And I would mm -hmm. cheer up every time I read that. But this mm -hmm. was not a woman who was going to be like, okay, got here, not really liking how this is going. Bye. Yeah. So like, Why does her director leave? In the published versions, there are a couple of vague comments made about her health, but there's nothing about her health up until then. So I was like, mm -hmm. I smell a rat. Mm -hmm. And I went to the um, Smith College archives um, library guide. And I saw there were letters from the women there. And so they, I had a one-year-old and a five-year-old. I could not pick up and go to Northampton. So I contacted the librarians. I said, well, I see you say, you know, you do digitization. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to digitize some of these letters for me? I had no idea how much was there because you can see, you know, who they have letters from, but you don't know how much material there is actually. And they were like, you realize this is a few thousand pages. 
I was like, yay! Mm -hmm. And they actually, they did. They digitized all of this stuff for me. And the story, once you got past the edit into the real letters, the private letters, the story that unfolded was just incredible. Yeah, gosh. Um, okay, I love how you had the two main characters. What was it? Kate and Emma? Emmy. 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 And they felt so real, but I read in your notes later that they were, you made them up, kind of. Yeah. So, I mean, this book, the material I was working with was so rich and their letter to mm -hmm. them was amazing. There were times I was really tempted to abandon the whole novel project and just be like, here's an annotated version of their letters. And I also very, even I though- would read that. You could do a follow-up. Yeah. I might have to fight a Smith professor for them. Um, sure. There's a Smith professor currently writing a book, a nonfiction book okay. about the unit, which makes me so happy and excited. Okay. But, um, uh, you know, but the other thing I thought about, I don't usually write biographical fiction, which is when you take real people's lives and you tell their story just with dialogue. Um, but I was very tempted to go the biographical fiction route here because the women in their letters, their personalities were so clear and so strong. Um, but I decided in the end, I wanted the freedom that came of having fictional people in place of the real ones so I could curate their emotional lives. And also, even though some of my characters are actually drawn very closely from the real, real women, it felt like it would be a betrayal of their trust to read their letters and then put their innermost thoughts and feelings mm -hmm. out there for everyone. Because like on a lot of their letters, they write home, these are private, these are my thoughts just for you. Please stop sending my letters into the alumni magazine. I did not mean to share this. And I felt like it would be wrong to share it even all these years yeah. later. So yeah. with my side characters, I do actually pull a lot of my side characters very closely from the real, real women. And the director, my fictional director of the unit, is incredibly closely modeled on the real director of the unit and so on. But this gave me the little bit of extra wiggle room to sort of allow for my interpretation of the way they appear in their letters. Um, and I had my heroines, although they are inspired by things I read in the letters and other women of the period, I decided to make them entirely fictional. They are not real people under another name. Mm -hmm. So, and I love, I love the the two main characters. How you know you start? Can you can you? You're talking so much. Take a breath. <laughs> great. I love I'll it. Take a sip of coffee. Yeah, do it. Because when going into this, I was like, I just want to. I don't care if we film it. I just want to sit down and hear you talk about this book because I loved it so much. I'm gonna sell the heck out of this thing. Thank so, you. <laughs> so well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about them because oh, I, I love, it. I love oh, talking about these women. I got a um, an advanced copy from Libro, the audiobook um, company. We love Libro FM. Um, plug for them; they're not sponsoring this, but um, no, they are lovely. Lovely. If you guys like audiobooks and you don't want to give your money to that certain corporation that has a lot of money, Libro FM is a great way to do it. So you pick out your local independent bookstore, and they give a percentage of each sale to that bookstore. But it's comparable to that other program that you may know of. Um, I wasn't that vague. I hope you guys understood. Yeah, that was that was beautifully euphemistic. That <laughs> so, was worthy of the Smithies. Thank you. Well, I went to Agnes Scott, so I did go to women's college. So you totally know the the world oh, yeah. and the yeah. mindset. And how did you do good euphemism? Yeah, we um we I have a uh, an alumni book two alumni book groups that I belong to, and I know for one one of them is going to read it, and I'll see oh, if I can get the other one to read it too. Um. Anyway, so what was I ask the the two main characters, they have such an interesting relationship. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, you know, I spent 13 years in all girls school. And so mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by the mechanics of female friendship, by you know, what draws people together, but also what causes breaks and fissures in those friendships. And I think the two are really closely related that often we are drawn to our friends because they have something in them that we perceive ourselves to lack. Mm -hmm. But that very same thing that draws you together often causes fissures in the relationship because you often feel like the other person is judging you for what you see as your lack. Mm -hmm. And that's very true in the case of my two heroines, Kate and Emmy, because they're the opposite ends of the spectrum. Kate is a scholarship girl. If you've ever read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. my inspiration for Kate was really very much Francie Nolan. Yeah, I'll, I'll put because it's, comments. it's exactly that same era. And Kate grows up poor in Brooklyn. She's a child of an Irish American mother and a Czech immigrant father. And I mean, they're dirt poor when she's growing up. By the time the book starts, her mother has remarried. 
mm-hmm. and is, you know, prosperous within the Irish American community in Brooklyn. But Kate had this very hard scrabble childhood where she lived in the library and really felt like she belonged nowhere and, you know, winds up at Smith and she's there on smart and winds up rooming with the daughter of an eccentric suffragette socialite, think Eleanor Roosevelt type, Mm -hmm. um, but you know, who is of Knickerbocker and Mayflower lineage, but poor Emmy, Kate's roommate, she comes from this gilded family and her mother is one of these eccentric proponents of the rights of women. And it has very firm ideas about education for women. And she wants Mm -hmm. Emmy to be a model of the new woman. Mm -hmm. And poor Emmy, she is not intellectual. Mm -hmm. She likes reading poetry. She does not want to read Caesar's Wars in the original Latin. She's all heart. Yeah. Um, But that does not count with her mother who wants Mm -hmm. her to be, you know, a, uh, an icon for the cause. And Mm -hmm. Emmy does not, Emmy just, exactly. She, she wants Emmy to have the advantages that she Mm -hmm. felt she didn't get when she was forced into being a debutante instead of being allowed to get an education. And she is Mm -hmm. giving Emmy the education she wished she could have had. The problem Mm -hmm. is poor Emmy, this is, it's so inappropriate for her. And she really struggles at Smith. Mm -hmm. And so each of them, you know, Emmy feels that she would never have graduated from Smith, but for Kate, but meanwhile, Kate feels no one have, would ever have accepted her socially, but for Emmy's friendship. And but uh, both of them are so fixated on their own perceived blacks. Neither of them realizes the other is insecure. Mm-hmm. And so, but their friendship really suffers a stumbling block right after Smith, when Kate goes home with Emmy to the summer for the summer to their college in Newport, and overhears Emmy's cousin Julia, who has her own issues, referring to her as Emmy's latest charity case which yeah. makes Kate rethink the entire relationship and wonder if she's just, because Emmy is the sort of person who feeds stray dogs. Mm-hmm. And you know, she wondered, has she always just been a stray dog for Emmy? And she deliberately breaks off ties. She gets a job at a young ladies academy in Boston teaching French, she hates. And, which she hates bitterly. It's like the worst possible thing for her. And, you know, they, they have, you know, several years where they just, Emmy writes letters, Kate answers, very tersely or doesn't answer at all. And they never officially have a friendship breakup, mm-hmm. but they are not, their friendship is sort of yeah. put on hold. I mean, we've all had relationships yeah. like that, I think. And then you know, a girl drops out at the last minute from the Smith unit, they need a replacement, Kate knows how to drive, she speaks French, mm-hmm. Emmy begs her to come and she is so miserable in her job, she agrees. But suddenly they're in this position where they're together again for the first time since Smith. Mm-hmm. And they're not the people they were then. And they have to figure out how to relate to each other in this strange new environment in their mm-hmm. grown up lives when they have all these unresolved issues from their friend. Well, I don't mm-hmm. want to call it friendship breakup, but you know what I mean? Where, you know, there, there was this fissure in their friendship, which Kate never bothered to explain to Emmy. Emmy never understood. She just thought Kate was too busy for her. And, you know, mm-hmm. maybe she was too much of a burden on Kate. And so they each have these sort of mistaken ideas about how the other perceives them but they're here in a war zone where they really have to work together and pull together. Mm-hmm. And these unresolved emotional issues start getting in the way. Oh, you did it so delicately. And Thank it was one you. of those, like, I'm not gonna give it away whether or not they get back together again, but they both kept getting to points where they were mature enough to, to move on without each other. But then you're like, oh, I hope they get back. Ooh, I moved it. I hope they get back. <laughs> together. So I, I loved it. You did it so well. And Thank I'm listening you. to you and I'm thinking, I need to reread the book. <laughs> I'm so glad. But yeah, you know, I think we've always, we've all, we all have those friendships too, these legacy friendships Mm -hmm. where you're like, is there a friendship here now? You know, can't, was there anything really to the friendship? Mm -hmm. Was this for real? Were we really friends of the heart or were we just friends of circumstance? And I think that's something that, you know, Kate and Emmy are exploring here. Is there, was there ever a real heart to the friendship? Is it something worth trying to reclaim or have they grown apart? And should they just grow and try to grow into the people they are now? but maybe that means they don't need each other anymore that they shouldn't mm-hmm. be together. And the, you know, anyone who's had a good female friend they've grown apart from knows that this can be, this is heart wrenching and it's really mm-hmm. hard. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Thank so you. what are you working on now? I'm actually working on a sort of prequel to the Smith book. Um, I know to band of sisters, I have to stop calling it the Smith book. It actually has a title now. You know how it is when something is something in your head for so long. Yeah. Um, but you no, know, when I was writing this, I was I became really fascinated by the founder of the unit, um, who's very closely based on a real woman, Harriet Boyd Hawes, who had this crazy and fascinating past. 
I mean, she went off, this was a woman who graduated from Smith in the 1890s mm -hmm. and was determined to be an archeologist. She went off to the American School of Classical Studies in Athens and now she was here to excavate. And this was at a time when women were not allowed to excavate. It was considered unladylike. And they mm -hmm. were like, would you like to be a classics librarian? And she's like, no, mm -hmm. you do not seem to understand. I am here to dig things up. Mm -hmm. And while she was there sort of you know, fighting for her right to dig, the Greco-Turkish war broke out mm -hmm. as Greco-Turkish wars periodically do. Mm -hmm. And she decided, she went and took a Red Cross nursing class, failed but pulled strings with the with, sorry, with the Greek aristocracy. She had friends in high places. And despite failing her Red Cross exam, got sent out to the front as a nurse um, mm -hmm. where she did such amazing things. She was decorated by the Queen of Greece for her bravery. But mm -hmm. this was where it really got weird and my attention was piqued. Because I think the thing that catches novelists' attention is when there are unexplained gaps. And you're like, wait, why did that happen? What are you leaving out? Like when because she disappeared type of gap. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because like, you know, it's just that type of gap. Because mm -hmm. a year later, she goes back to Greece and she digs up Crete and becomes mm -hmm. groundbreaking and people are still talking about her work today and blah, blah, blah. But there's this weird gap where she suddenly goes back to the United States and winds up nursing in the Spanish-American War. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, what brought her to Cuba? And at first I thought, did she have like a brother or a sweetheart who's down there? But no, no, she didn't. And um, I can't tell you about the real, the, what the real woman's motivations were for doing this, but my fictional version of her started dropping these weird little hints to me as I was writing her throughout the book. Because every now and then when you're writing, a character will start poking you and be like, pay attention to me. I have something to tell you. There's a story here. And that was what this character started doing to me. And I was like, oh my God something really horrible happened during the Greco-Turkish War and she has to go, this is how she redeems herself. And there was this whole backstory that suddenly unrolled for me. And so that's why I'm writing right now about this young Smith grad who is determined to be an archeologist, but her life gets torn apart in ways I, I will not tell you because it's a spoiler, in the Greco-Turkish War. And she winds up in her you know, heartbreak and self-hate, winds up going and nursing in the Spanish American War and find mm -hmm. there, you know, the woman she's meant to be and the, becomes the woman who later founds the Smith unit. Oh so goodness. yeah, That's it's amazing. like, I'm having fun with the Spanish American War because it's another one of these, like, you know, so much of my source material for these, for Band of Sisters was like, oh my God, this is so crazy. How can this mm -hmm. be true? Which is my favorite kind of history. And the Spanish American War is another one of these, oh my God, this is so crazy. How did this really happen? I am finding all of these amazing details. Oh, and the other thing, while I'm rambling, yeah. the other thing I love about, so one of the things I adored about writing Band of Sisters was here was a real story about groundbreaking, heroic American women who people had forgotten. Like they'd been, they were a thing in their time. There were tons of articles about them. They were actually so well known that um, during their time in France, the Red Cross takes them on and jokes. And oh, by the way, so when the Band of Sisters, so when the Smith Unit is first formed, um, mm -hmm. The Red Cross will not sponsor them. They think this is an insane idea, a group of Smith grads going to the Somme. And mm -hmm. they think they're going to crash and burn and they won't take them. And so they get sp sponsored by the American Fund for the French Wounded, but it's all very provisional and they know they're on probation. Um, midway through their time in France, like six months in, the Red Cross winds up taking them over. Mm -hmm. And they joke that you know the Smith unit is so well known and so popular that this will do great things for the Red Cross's reputation. So that's mm -hmm. how it, you know, Anyway, but then, but now no one has heard of them. And so in this new book, um, this amazing librarian friend of mine, who is based, by the way, also a neighbor of yours, she's also in Georgia, um, oh. found me this incredible material because I was having so much trouble finding stuff about nurses in the Spanish-American War and Clara Barden and the Red Cross. Like there are these great books that have come out recently about the Spanish-American War. One of them has zero references to the Red Cross and one of them has two lines in the whole mm. book. And so she went and dug up all this material for me and there are some really great stories about women who did incredible and heroic things and mm -hmm. who were again, media sensations in their mm -hmm. own time, but their stories have somehow been entirely written out. And I just, I love taking these stories and writing them back into the narrative. Mm -hmm.
Oh, I can't wait. Oh my goodness. So we have copies of Band of Sisters in stock. You can also buy it from our website. Um, some of you may know that we had a flood last week and so our bookstore is temporarily closed. We plan on re unpacking it this weekend and setting up shop next week or as of this weekend and a temporary location. And so we will have Band of Sisters in stock right now. It's in a box. Uh, but you can order from our website and I put a link down in the comments. So please do. And um, if you would like a signed copy, I will oh, yeah. send book plates. So I, book plates. Yeah, I want my own copy. Can you sign one oh to me? Gosh, absolutely. I would be honored. Awesome. And I'm, I'm making my kids read this. So Yay. it's going to be hard because they're teenagers. So, oh yeah, no, this is, and I will say that, you know, for anyone who's wondering, this is mm -hmm. a, you know, entirely appropriate for all age yeah. groups. I mean, you know, there's war. Mm -hmm. There are bad yeah. things that happen in war, but there's nothing explicit in mm -hmm. here. No, this is perfect for like a, a teenager who wants a good historical fi fiction, not so fiction book. It, yeah, <laughs> I love it. I'm going to sell the heck thank out of you. it. So anyway, thank you for doing this. I know, I know you, your life is crazy right now. because Well, and so is yours with the flood. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Apologies, mm -hmm. everyone, for our late start. That was totally me. Um, we had a, a child care snafu and there was a yeah. First grader trying to zoom in at the same time that a preschooler <laughs> was having toilet issues. You do not need oh to know goodness. the details, but any mothers among you will understand. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. So, um, yes, I'm going to read the book again and we have them in stock and I would love for some book plates, please. That'd be great. I would be delighted. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you Bye. so much. And if you, Oh, you can still talk. We can hear you. Oh, I can still talk. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, sorry, I, I have trouble stopping talking. But I was just going to say, if you want to know more about um, the mm -hmm. Smith College Relief Unit or Band of Sisters, come visit me at my website at www.laurenwillig.com. On the mm -hmm. band under my books page, on the Band of Sisters page, there is a reader's guide that has maps, <gasps> pictures, that. recipes, and yeah. all sorts of background material about the Real Smith Unit and links to their letters in the Alumni Quarterly and those memoirs I mentioned. So if you are curious about the real brave women who went to France to save French women and children, head over to www.laurenwilg.com and find the Reader's Guide. Okay, yeah. I'll be quiet now. No, you're fine. You can keep going. I'll sit here and listen to you talk all day. Oh, um, that's so sweet of you. I put a link down in the comments if anybody's interested. There's also a really cool video um, where Lauren talks about uh, Band of Sisters as well. All right. Thank Bye, you, guys. Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.